Time for questions to the Executive Office. We will start with listed questions. And just to notify the Assembly that questions 2, 3, 6 and 9 have been withdrawn. I call Kate Nicholl. Please. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since 2016, we have allocated over £25 million through the Central Good Relations Fund to support more than 780 projects across all geographical areas to the benefit of more than 260,000 people. Uh, the Central Good Relations Fund is an annual merit-based programme designed to deliver and support projects in areas where there is a good relations need. These projects uh, are a key aspect of building peace and reconciliation while bringing people together through common interests such as sport, arts and improving mental health. In addition, these projects often provide opportunities for participants to build new skills, gain qualifications and employment opportunities and develop new friendships. We remain committed to Central Good Relations Fund delivery with a clear focus on prioritising and maximising the number of projects delivered. Ms. Nicol. Uh, I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer. Would she agree with me that Northern Ireland um, is now a more diverse uh, society and as such the Good Relations Fund could widen to include newcomer communities uh, whilst also acknowledging that actually there's lots of brilliant work being done by the voluntary community sector who can't avail of this because it's so oversubscribed. Thank you. Deputy First Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Central Good Relations Fund was developed to be that flexible scheme sitting in the centre. It was never designed to replace other funding, and we do have other funding schemes that are dedicated or ring fenced for particular purposes. But Central Good Relations is probably the most flexible scheme that we have. It is founded very much in terms of uh, Section 75.2 of the Northern Ireland Act, and that, of course, extends to not only in terms of uh, political and religious viewpoints, but also in terms of different racial groups. When this was designed at the time, it did take into account um, new in gr in in incomer groups and, and other aspects of that. Um, so there is flexibility there, but it is oversubscribed, um, and I suspect it will continue to be oversubscribed because of the demands of it. I call uh, Melissa McHugh. Good. Can the Deputy First Minister provide an update on the Together Building a United Community Review and whether she thinks that there is merit uh, in this review engaging with the Flags Identity, Culture and Tradition uh, recommendations? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I think it provides um, a perfect opportunity to take a look at not just the recommendations coming out of the FICT um, report, but also the thinking and the considerations within that substantive report as well. The review is um, well underway. There has been a conclusion of the stakeholder engagement process. There's also been an extensive uh, paper um, exercise in terms of research in conjunction with some of the universities here, Ulster University and Queen's University, to look at the developments within key policy areas. That will all be woven into the consideration of the revised strategy, but I think it would be absolutely appropriate, given the alignment between VICT and TBOC, um, for that to be fully taken into account as part of that review process. Jan Forsyth. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can the Deputy First Minister outline how the impact of the Good Relations projects are measured? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's incredibly important that we do measure um, these projects and interventions to ensure that the funding that goes in to support them is going into the right types of interventions and in the right uh, places. So that's why we do baseline um, in relation to all of the individual projects. We monitor that in terms of the improvement of relationships and attitudes within the cohort that take part in these projects. Uh, and we do that at an individual project level, but we also do that across in terms of measuring um, all kinds of different indicators which are picked to um, give us a sense around um, how effective these uh, things are. So yes, we do monitor this on a continuous basis, and the critical thing is that those evaluations are weaved into uh, our consideration of the way forward in terms of the amendment to or any changes to future uh, funding schemes. Matthew O'Toole. Mr. Speaker, Minister, would you agree with First, Deputy First Minister? Would you agree with me that 26 years now on from the Good Friday Agreement, evidence of young teenagers pulling down party electoral posters in order to put on bonfires are not ex good examples of progress in terms of good relations. Would you condemn those acts? And would you further agree with me that modelling proper good relation, a commitment to good relations should start by political leaders calling that out and also calling out the proliferation of paramilitary flags? Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and indeed, building on the very good debate I think that we had in this assembly, I, I believe that all parties are strongly united against um, paramilitarism, and also the demonstrations of that three flags are in any other way. Likewise, it is a critically important part of democracy that every uh, candidate can stand, can uh, promote uh, what it is that they want um, voters to examine um, and give voters the opportunity to, to be um, as informed as they possibly can be and to do so without any intimidation. So, of course, I, th I believe that everyone across this House would be uh, united uh, in terms of that approach. Philip McGuigan. Three. Question three. Question four, thank you, Mr. Uh, Sorry, uh, Kesh Deborah uh, Kahar. Question four. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That will teach me a lesson to, to remove the material for the withdrawn questions. I did not have question number three, but I do have question number four. We are very aware of the needs of victims and survivors and remain committed to introducing legislation into this Assembly for a statutory public inquiry and redress scheme as soon as possible. There are a number of complex and sensitive issues for us to consider carefully. It is important victims and survivors are at the centre of this, which is why a public consultation on the key policy proposals is essential. We want to meet with Victim and Survivors Consultative uh, Consultation Forum and seek the views of executive colleagues before um, coming to a decision on some of those points. It is anticipated that the consultation will be launched in a matter of weeks. We are actively considering uh, the proposals and will include online and, but also face-to-face -face events to make sure as many people as possible will have the opportunity to contribute during the 12-week period. This remains one of the most difficult parts of our past, but we are committed to the three core aims of truth, acknowledgement and accountability. Paul, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer to question number four uh, and her commitment to introduce legislation for a statutory public inquiry and redress scheme as soon as possible. If I can just ask the Deputy First Minister if she will commit to engage with key groups in advance of the publication of the public consultation. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely. And as I understand it, we are in the process of establishing uh, those meetings if they're not already in the diary. I always believe that it is critically important to speak directly to those most impacted, um, and that uh, not only in this area but across um, all of the policy areas within the department is what the First Minister and I will strive to do. So, yes, we will be meeting with them. We believe that is very, very important, and we want to continue to ensure that this process is a victim centred process and that this process works for those most impacted by it. Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Deputy First Minister, for your answer so far. Um, you, you will recall from the Historical Institution Bus inquiry, um, Sir Anthony Hart, in advance of its publication, indicated that, they, that he was going to recommend a redress scheme. And so the victims and survivors had to wait about four years, really, from that indication until the redress scheme was set up. Um, to what degree can you commit that the redress scheme will sit alongside the public inquiry as opposed to be subsequent to? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, this is an, an unusual aspect of this in the sense of that the initial redress scheme in terms of the standardised payment will be sitting alongside the public inquiry. And you're absolutely right, that was done based on the experience um, where there is an actual and real need um, within those most impacted for that type of support now. Um, but we're also very aware that a public inquiry does take time, not least in terms of the legislation and the foundations for that, but also building the organisation up. Um, listening to that evidence, the consideration of that. So yes, we are fully committed to the standardised payment being um, released at the same time. Um, as you know, that there's a phase two in terms of a more tailored payment that that will come further down the line. But it's important to meet the needs um, of those most impacted as soon as we, we possibly can. Declan Kearney. Yes, the whole. Minister. Uh, meetings of the North South Ministerial Council resumed on the 8th of April with a plenary meeting held in Armagh. Since then, ministers have met to discuss a range of issues within the sectoral um, format, including trade and business development, special EU programmes, education, agriculture, language and environmental and aquaculture just this morning. Meetings in the remaining sectors will be taking place over the coming weeks and months. The focus has been on ensuring appropriate governance is in place for the North South bodies, including appointing CEOs appointing board members and agreeing business plans. The Northside Ministerial Council is also considering how the various Northside Ministerial Council sectors can contribute to addressing climate change and the loss of biodiversity. Mr. Kearney. 
from my uh, council. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my thanks to the Deputy First Minister for her answer. Deputy First Minister, uh, Loch Ness is not only the largest uh, freshwater body on the island of Ireland, but it also, as you know, provides 40 per cent of our drinking water in this region. It is also integral to the environment, the biodiversity, the economy of the Loch Shore community and also the adjoining uh, waterways. Can you set out for us this afternoon what steps you are prepared and committed to take to build upon the discussion at the last NSMC on the issue of Loch Ness? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the issues pertaining to Loch Ness are, of course, um, predominantly issues for the Northern Ireland Executive and the Minister for Agriculture. Um, we did have those discussions in the North South format, um, particularly in relation to the area of sharing expertise and research. Um, of course, we know that these issues are longer term issues as well, so that research and that collaboration will be important in terms of looking at the medium to longer term interventions. But, of course, urgent action. <coughs> is required now. That why, that's why I welcome the £1.6 million that has been set aside in this budget um, for urgent actions in this year, uh, and that was supported by most of the executive. We all know that in our constituencies, there are aspects of our constituencies that touch on Loch Ness, but we also know it's a Northern Ireland-wide issue. It was disappointing, I have to say, that not all ministers in that executive supported that £1.6 million being allocated, but it was the right thing to do. We must all collectively work to ensure that there are immediate interventions while we continue with that uh, research to ensure that there's the right longer-term interventions as well. Brian Kingston. Speaker, and the Deputy First Minister will agree with me that East-West relations through the East-West Council and the British Irish Council are just as important and vital as North-South relations through the North-South Ministerial Council. Uh, with the general election taking place on the 4th of July, uh, will the next meeting of the British Irish Council still proceed as planned? Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, absolutely. Um, the uh, first uh, meeting since devolution um, of the BIC British Irish Council will take place at the end of next week in the Isle of Man. Uh, we will be participating in that. I think it's, it is critically important that we continue to build on those relationships. There has been a significant amount of change in terms of the leadership um, across those participants, um, but we look forward to building those strong um, relationships because, of course, big issues like climate change uh, um, in terms of growing our economy, the way that we operate within the international space, all of those issues uh, will be helped by closer cooperation, um, including uh, across this United Kingdom. David Honeyford. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just to ask the first, our Deputy First Minister for an update on what work has taken place in the new international relations strategy during the months of May and June of this year. Minister. I thank the member for his question. Um, there has been extensive work done in terms of the review of the Good Relations uh, Strategy, um, and we uh, officials are currently finalising uh, that based on the extensive consultation that they have done, um, and we look forward to seeing those proposals coming forward. Cool. question seven. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. TU is responsible for taking forward the necessary arrangements to implement the provisions of the Identity and Language Northern Ireland Act 2022, including the establishment of the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression, the Irish Language Commissioner, and the Commissioner for the Ulster Scots and the Ulster British Tradition. We have given initial consideration to the appointments process and hope to make an announcement in due course regarding the necessary recruitment competitions. We will keep members updated. Mr. Delargy. Thank the Deputy First Minister for her response. Um, and it's very welcome that an announcement will be coming forward in due course regarding those recruitment competitions. So will the Deputy First Minister detail um, the reason why the three bodies have not yet been established? And can she commit to setting out a more definitive timeline for the recruitment of these three bodies? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. These are public appointments and they're also statutory bodies. They are brand new. Um, so therefore, there's been a considerable amount of work done in terms of the establishment of that through the legislation. Because they are um, public appointments um, regulated by the Public Appointments Commissioner, there are a number of necessary and legal steps that we have to go through. Um, there will be three different uh, recruitment competitions, but all operating at the same time with the aim of recruiting um, eight 
individuals because, of course, the Office of Identity have more than one. So it is a substantial undertaking, and we have considered the initial um, submission in relation to this and have agreed that. So we're now waiting for the more detailed around the legalities, the contracts, the proposals, the job spec, and all of those different requirements that we need to look at. So yes, it is a lengthy process, but we are determined that this uh, will proceed, but will proceed in a way which gets the right people um, absolutely for these posts. John Mulholland. Thank you very much, um, Deputy First Minister, um, for outlining the timeline. And I'm just wondering if you could um, elaborate just on what budget has been set aside for this, um, for the financial year 24-25, please. Minister. Thank you. Um, the public pro uh, appointments process generally takes between six to 12 months, um, from, especially if they are new um, recruitment processes. So in terms of the financial implication for that in this year's budget, um, it would really be the cost of the recruitment uh, competition. We will not know the actual cost of the office until we look at the initial business plans um, for those proposed offices, and those will come up um, for agreement in terms of the business and corporate plans. We have flagged this with the um, Department of Finance that there isn't a budget currently sitting within our uh, lines uh, to support this, but uh, it is something that we have flagged to the uh, finance um, department, but in all likelihood it will be into the next financial year before there is any actual uh, um, expenditure required against those three um, establishments of the offices. The Minister. Business cases have been presented, but the department must have some idea of the likely cost of these bodies. What is that estimate? Minister. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So all of these costs are ultimately scalable and dependent on how many staff. Um, the agreement of the business and corporate plan. Um, no body can ever do everything that they want to do. So it is about, of course, um, looking at whatever budget is available and people being able to fit and prioritise uh, within that. Um, of course, the starting point for that would be looking at the statutory duties of each of these. Um, commissioners, um, but also in terms of the individual appointments, uh, the proposals that they make. Um, it is, of course, absolutely essential that this is done on a fair and equitable basis. So we look forward to seeing the plans being put forward and assessing those in accordance with the budget that we are able to achieve for those offices to ensure that they can make a meaningful and positive um, a difference. Declan McAleer is not in this place. I call Matthew O'Toole. Speaker, question 10. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions 10 and 12 together. Uh, we are working to finalise a draft programme for government and hope to begin consultation soon. Uh, publication and consultation dates are under consideration due to the pre-election period. We want to hear views on the draft document from uh, uh, as many people as possible during the consultation period. We will deliver a consultation process which allows individuals, stakeholders and delivery partners to help shape our vision, and we will make use of both in-person and online events to help this process. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are we to understand from the Deputy First Minister that the programme of government is actually drafted but cannot be published yet? And secondly, can I ask the Deputy First Minister, in response to a question that I submitted, we established that 100 meetings, at least 100 meetings, took place between executive parties and the civil service between the Assembly election in 2022 and the restoration of these institutions in February 2024. Given it's now more than four months since we got back and we still haven't seen the programme for government, what on earth were you talking about? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member will be well aware of the difference between uh, political discussions and being informed of ongoing um, issues and the duties that we have as ministers to discharge in relation to the programme for government. These are two entirely different processes. And therefore, as far as this programme for government uh, goes, this is very much a process that has commenced when we took on these roles. Uh, of course, there, are, uh, there is learning to take from uh, that process. Um, but, of course, we want to make sure that this is a programme for government that can fit um, within the sadly limited um, budget uh, flexibility that we have, but still one that makes a significant difference on the key issues. We have already highlighted what some of those prioritised issues are. Those are the issues of uh, childcare, of tackling the big challenges within our health system, supporting those uh, uh, families with uh, children with special educational needs. These are big issues. Those will be prioritised uh, within that, but it is right and proper that we take uh, the time to ensure that those are integrated through these uh, proper roles that we uh, hold uh, at the moment. Nick Matheson. 
you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank uh, the Deputy First Minister for her answer so far. Um, can the Deputy First Minister confirm how the programme for government will align uh, with the legislative programme on budget for the executive? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member will be aware about how challenging the current budget is, uh, and the number one uh, priority initially must be to try to maintain our public services to the best standard we possibly can within the budget envelope. That will inevitably limit uh, the discretion that we have in ter- and flexibility that we may have in terms of new policies. Uh, but we, we, we are very clear that this is not about trying to do everything and put everything into a programme for government. We do want to prioritise. We have highlighted, as I've said, a number of those issues already. Uh, issues such as the lack of affordable childcare, putting pressures um, on families right throughout Northern Ireland. We all know about the challenges within the health service. Um, but look, let's not uh, make no mistake. There is not a significant amount of money that gives flexibility for a huge range of new issues. This must be about supporting our existing public services, trying to ensure transformation and improvement against those uh, absolutely necessary improvement, and continuing to build for the opportunity for when further investment is uh, available to us as an executive for those new um, and prioritised areas. Jake, question 11, please. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Communities in Transition has operated across eight designated areas since 2019. Our officials are currently carrying out a comprehensive review of phases one and two of the programme to inform planning and delivery of any future phase beyond March 2025, should funding become available. And as part of this, consideration will be given to refreshing the initial research which identified the current eight CIT areas. Uh, in terms of impact of CIT in West Belfast since 2019, there has been the investment of approximately £3.7 million of projects uh, delivered in the area include health and wellbeing, community safety, employability, ex-prisoner support and restorative practice. From research, it is clear that these local initiatives continue to be at the forefront of tackling a range of problems um, in West Belfast. Mr Sheehan. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. My thanks to the Minister for her answer. Her answer. I'm wondering, could she outline what the plans are for communities in Transition 3? Graham Albert. Minister. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the project continues to be rolled out in terms of this phase. Throughout this phase, we will be evaluating um, those projects to ensure that we are, are pulling forward the best practice. Um, look, there's been a significant positive impact of this programme across the communities where these projects have been uh, rolled out. And I think it would be important to try to mainstream as much of that as possible, but to try to ensure the continuation of some of this um, support. You know, we've seen a, a significant number of uh, participants um, in uh, those uh, areas, and I think that has been very, very positive. I think we're seeing increases in community resilience. We're seeing a very significant reduction in relation to paramilitary-related style attacks. Um, and you know, this is all uh, very, very positive, and I think we do need to build on this moving forward. Philip Rep. The Deputy First Minister recently attended an event that I hosted here at Parliament Building celebrating uh, the role of young people across North Belfast and Newton Abbey who took part in the CIT programme. Would the Deputy First Minister join with me in congratulating Northern Ireland Alternatives for the excellent work that they continue to do in delivering for the communities most in need in my constituency? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. Look, absolutely, Northern Ireland Alternatives do fantastic work um, in the local community and have done so for some considerable time. Um, in this role, I've had the opportunity to come along and to see some of their important work and uh, their celebration events. You know, undoubtedly, um, NI Alternatives have impacted on thousands and thousands of lives across the community, particularly in North Belfast, but also beyond over many years. And certainly, they are a, a delivery partner for the executive office that we are very proud to have, but also that we have relied on for very many years to deliver these programmes in such an effective way across communities, really changing lives for the better. Andrew McMurray. And thank you, Deputy First Minister. Um, to ask the Deputy First Minister uh, what learning will be applied for, from the work of the Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition to moving forward with transition? Thank you. Sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Commission report is a substantive one. It contains a significant amount of analysis, and that analysis was based on an extensive consultation process with stakeholders from right throughout the community. And while the recommendations were not all fully agreed by the Commission, I think as a piece of work it is hugely valuable, and that that piece of work should inform the work not just with Together Building United Community, because I absolutely believe that it can, and I think it should inform some of the actions coming out of that as well. But you're absolutely right. I think this is a useful piece of work to inform uh, communities in transition, because we know that um, some of the difficult issues that uh, communities are still facing um, are those that have uh, an implication from the legacy of the past and, and have connections to some of the paramilitarism of the past. So absolutely, I believe that it will be an important piece of work in terms of evaluation and review and, uh, on the way forward. Mark Durkin. Speaker, Deputy First Minister, before expanding or uh, extending or renewing the programme, are you convinced that an appropriate appraisal has been or will be made of its impact in transitioning communities away from paramilitarism for good? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, for some considerable time, the Department has ensured that we do evaluate uh, projects, and for good reason. You know, if we're not measuring the impact of these programmes and projects, then we don't know what impact they are having. So we do set um, baselines around um, attitudes, um, different types of indicators initially at an individual project level, but also at the programme level as well. Um, and that, that is absolutely important. Like if a project is not working, then that project should not be funded to continue. If a project is working in a particular area or in a particular context, then we need to know that so we can actually take that and roll that out elsewhere. Because fundamentally, what we are all about is finding the things that work and changing uh, the outcomes um, for the better in terms of the objectives of those types of projects. Call Justin McNulty. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Executive Committee will continue to meet during the pre-election period. The business of departments will also continue as normal, subject only to any changes considered necessary to adhere to the pre-election guidance. Decisions on specific activities or items of business are a matter for each Minister. Mr. McDonald. I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, good to see you at our show on Saturday. First Minister, didn't see I was too busy running around after we fell in the, in the foreground. What's the First Minister's assessment of a requirement for ministers and the executive to step down whilst campaigning for and seeking election to other legislators? Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. So there is guidance that has been published. That guidance uh, is online. It's available for everybody to take a look at. Um, of course, the devolved assemblies are not uh, impacted uh, particularly by the period of PERDA, but there are implications for ministers in terms of announcements on the approach. Um, so obviously it's a matter for each individual minister um, in accordance with that guidance, but it's clear that we do need to be careful in terms of uh, some of the issues and how we approach those. Owen Tennyson. Mr. Speaker. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have made the transformation of public services a key priority for the executive. Many sectors need investment and reform in order to ensure equitable access to the high quality services that our citizens expect and to make public finance sustainable. The executive has agreed an approach proposed by the finance minister for making quick progress on the use of 235 million of ring fenced funding available for transformation. The Finance Minister has established an interim Public Sector Transformation Board, which will make recommendations in relation to projects which could be supported by this funding. Mr. Tennyson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the Deputy First Minister agree with me that tackling the cost of division in our society and in our services should be a priority for all ministers as part of a programme for public service transformation, not least to ensure more efficient and effective outcomes, but also as a means of integration and reconciliation in our community? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's important that all of these issues are considered, and of course, for the rollout of any public services, I think we have a shared objective and outcome, which is to ensure that those public services work for those who need them uh, when they need them. And certainly, we 
listen all of the time to those trying to use uh, services across education, health and our, our public services and we know that those public services are under pressure. So of course the avoidance of duplication is important but as is finding the right interventions of transformation to ensure that we can do more with the budget that we have uh, and to ensure that we can continue uh, to build on those, the positive work being done within our public sector but to improve upon um, our public services including within the health sector. Egan. Number 15, please. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The head of the civil service launched an external recruitment exercise to fill vacancies in two permanent sector roles in December 2023. The competition produced two successful candidates. One of the successful candidates, Mr. Ian Snowden, was appointed to the uh, Department of the Economy post on the 28th of March 24. However, the TEO post remains vacant. In terms of next steps, the TEO permanent secretary role will now be filled on an interim basis through an internal temporary promotion opportunity. Uh, we now move to topical questions. I call Matthew to uh, Deputy First Minister, this Saturday at the Allianz uh, Arena, the first match of the European Football Championships 2024 will take place. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could be sure that 2028 was going to happen at Casement Park in Belfast? Can I ask whether you support that happening, but more importantly, what specific conversations have you and the First Minister had with the UK Government to ensure that the funding required is delivered to make that tournament happen here in Belfast? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member will be aware about how difficult the fiscal situation is currently for Northern Ireland and how difficult the Northern Ireland uh, budget is. Uh, therefore, this is a matter uh, for the UK government um, in terms of ongoing discussions, and I know that a number of uh, ministers and others have been making representations to that end. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, I know how difficult the fiscal position is. That's why I asked you what representations your office, the head of devolved government here, led by the First and Deputy First Minister, had made to the UK government. Earlier on, Mr. Kingston asked you about the importance of the East West Council and the British Irish Council. Have you used that or any other route to press for funding to ensure that the Euros come to Belfast and Casement Park is built in time? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member will be aware that we have been pressing the UK government on a range of issues pertaining to the budget. The Northern Ireland budget is incredibly difficult. We know the impact of that, not least in terms of the pressures within our health system, the pressures in terms of our waiting lists, the pressures in terms of the impact of that. Uh, we know the pressures on our, our education system. This is not a single issue issue. This is an issue about our, our core public services that people need of health, of education, in terms of our roads, in terms of our investment. Organisations are crying out for funding, and I have certainly not been behind the door in terms of making those strong rep representations to the UK government. We are prepared to step up and do transformation, but we also need the budget from the UK government to enable us to do that in order to deliver on our core public services that will impact positively on everyone throughout Northern Ireland. Andale. I ask the Deputy First Minister to confirm the Executive's priorities and whether a programme for government will robustly measure these priorities. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Absolutely. Um, the member will be aware that we have pushed forward with an outcomes-focused uh, uh, programme for government, and the purposes of that is to see the bigger picture around our objectives of, of having public uh, services that deliver for people, of ensuring that what we do uh, grows our economy, that provides a better, brighter future for everyone in Northern Ireland. But of course, uh, how do we do that? And how we do that must be the particular actions that we take uh, as an executive and within those departments. But as said earlier um, in these questions, we also need to ensure that what we are doing works. And we only know it works if we are measuring, uh, measuring uh, those interventions. So absolutely, there will be a, a framework in terms of the indicators. Those will be baselined and it will be measured throughout the lifetime of this programme for government to inform um, us moving forward as well. So it's an important part, um, but it will be fully integrated within our programme. <coughs> Mr. Hall. Thank you, Deputy First Minister, for that answer. And I was at a, an event this morning in Clifton House uh, regarding hidden homelessness, and there's deep concern amongst our housing providers and, and those who are involved in that area at the, the funding made available to the Social Housing Development Programme and the ability for the Executive to truly take a cross-departmental approach to tackling the housing crisis group in Northern Ireland. Can the Deputy First Minister outline how this Executive will truly get the grips with the crisis impacting Northern Ireland? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And absolutely, it highlights once again how difficult our budget is. 
In terms of the budget set for this year, it was divided on approximately 50% of that budget to health, 30% of that budget to education, 10% of that budget to justice, and that left just 10% to be divided across the other departments, including the Department of the Communities that takes the lead in relation to housing. Uh, housing is an issue of significant concern. Uh, to some extent, we are behind where some other jurisdictions are in relation to the housing crisis. But you will know from speaking to those uh, at that event this morning, and we all know from speaking to people throughout uh, Northern Ireland and in our constituencies, that the housing crisis is already putting pressure on families. We need more social and affordable housing. We must make sure that our young families and people in Northern Ireland can get uh, homes can get onto the housing market. So, look, we need to be taking action on this now. Uh, it is a product, unfortunately, of the difficult budget position, but I'm acutely aware of those pressures, and we will continue to try to seek those, that additional resource to ensure that we can build what we need to build. Deputy First Minister, you probably uh, seen the recent Ulster Bank uh, survey, which showed uh, the, the sharpest rise in orders uh, for the first time in, in two years. Would you join with me in welcoming this good news that, that indicates that our uh, local economy and private sector, in particular, are growing? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I think it's, uh, it's certainly a positive um, indication. But we, know, we do know how difficult it is, though. Um, and I think that while we can welcome that good news, uh, and we've said many times since we've taken this role, both the First Minister and myself, that we want to prioritise uh, that prosperity agenda. We need our economy to grow and we need to do whatever we can uh, as jointly leading the executive but also working with our ministers to ensure that we have the right interventions, the right contacts to allow our economy to grow. But I think it would be wrong of me not to recognise that it's very difficult in terms of the inflationary rises. Um, and different costs arises on small to medium sized business here who are battling through a challenging situation. But again, to send that message that we are here to support those businesses, we're here to listen to you and to try to ensure that we can grow our economy moving forward. Monsieur. Gora Maigat, uh, would you uh, agree with me in that context then that it is, I suppose, uh, really important for both Invest NA and the executive to maximise and um, sort of focus on the, the benefits and opportunities that come from dual market access. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it would be wrong to say focus in the sense that uh, we know that our economy is made up of many different elements. There will be, of course, some aspects of it that do uh, impact in relation to that, um, particularly in relation to the exporting and exporting of goods and the manufacturing of goods. We know that we are a largely small to medium-sized uh, business economy here, uh, and many of those are indigenous and, and only trade within Northern Ireland. We must show uh, support for those. They are the backbone of our economy, and we do want to support them. And likewise, foreign direct investment is so important and essential. We know that the biggest growth area of that, of course, has been in the services industry that isn't impacted by dual market access. So I think it's important that we, we move forward in parallel uh, with a whole range of those key aspects of our economy. I think only by doing so will we be able to grow that economy and to ensure that prosperity agenda moving forward. Matheson. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, can the Deputy First Minister outline what actions are being taken uh, to progress the recommendations of the 2021 Flags Identity, Culture and Tradition Report? Thank you, Mr Speaker. As indicated already in these questions, uh, we had a good debate um, in this Assembly on that issue. I think there is a huge amount of important and useful work that has been done by that Commission. And I think that there is an opportune time in terms of the evaluation and review, for example, of Together Building a United Community to ensure that that uh, learning, that some of those recommendations um, are fully taken into account in terms of the process of that. Mr. Matheson. Uh, thank the Deputy First Minister uh, for her answer. Um, given the debate that you referenced in the Chamber, uh, where the motion was passed that a consultation would be held into the issue of flying of flags, um, what work has specifically been undertaken uh, to progress that consultation? Minister. As indicated, um, Mr. Speaker, the work uh, that we're focused on at the moment is in relation to the review of TBOC, Together Building the United Community. There has been hugely positive indications in terms of the impact of Together Building the United Community. Uh, and of course, this is largely focused on good relations between people uh, throughout Northern Ireland. So, of course, the work of the Vict Commission is relevant to that. We know that the, where there are challenges, it is very often, as indicated, because of some of the elements of the uh, disputed and contested history that we have here. So, I think it is a good opportunity for us to fully take that into account and see if we can find a way forward. Kate Nicholl. 
the speaker. Uh, last week, a mother and her terrified daughter made the news for a racial hate crime um, in my constituency. Uh, the daughter is so terrified that she doesn't leave the house unless going to school. Will the Deputy First Minister join with me in condemning all racist hate crimes um, and make it very clear that there is no place for this behaviour in our society? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like, I do believe um, that everyone in this House would agree absolutely. There is no space whatsoever for hate crimes based on any characteristic, including race. We must all stand united against uh, such things. People must be able to live their lives free from harassment and hate, no matter where they are uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, thank you, Deputy First Minister. Um, to follow on, then, what reassurances can you and your office give to people who are living in fear that the racial equality strategy will be robust, it will be co-designed and co-delivered, and that it will be brought to this House soon? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was the Executive Office that really led the way in relation to co-production and co-design in a number of our processes, not least the first Together Building a United Community consultation. Uh, we adopted a very, very detailed stakeholder co-production approach for that. I think that was the first time that any department had done such a thing. Um, and of course, it has evolved and improved since then. And I'm glad to see that being mainstreamed right across. You're absolutely right. The racial equality strategy must be effective. And I think to be effective, it must be co-designed. It must be something that works. Otherwise, what is the point of doing it? We want this to be effective, and we want it to work, and we want it to support everybody that it needs to support. Mr. McAleer is not in this place. I call on him. And I'm sure that many people in this chamber have seen the fantastic achievements last night by Kira McGeehan. Would the Deputy First Minister join with me in congratulating Kira on her gold medal? Minister. Uh, absolutely, um, fantastic, and it was good to see, and it's good to see the, the really, really positive reception to it. You know, so many of our young athletes from Northern Ireland are really shining on the international stage. It does drive us to um, say that we must do even more to support them, um, not least in relation to uh, their training and their journey right through, uh, because uh, they are fantastic ambassadors for sport. They're fantastic ambassadors for for young people, and indeed for Northern Ireland. Ms Murphy. I'd like to thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer. Minister, would you also agree with me that this should be an inspiration for, for young people, especially young girls and young women, in relation to participation in sports? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely. It's something I'm very passionate about. We know that many, many uh, young girls uh, fall out of uh, playing sport um, at a relatively young age when um, very often boys and men continue to play, particularly team sports, throughout their teenage years into their 20s and beyond. Um, so it's something that I think we need to support more of to ensure that our young uh, girls continue to participate in sport, uh, not just um, at that elite level, but at every single level. But of course, it's fantastic to see our young young athletes um, competing at that elite level as well. And again, as I said, we know that they, that requires additional support um, for those that are exceptional in order to allow them to shine, and that's something that we need to be looking at. Paul Freud. Uh, Deputy First Minister, the vaccine-injured and bereaved community have been waiting since February for a diary date for your office to meet with them and with people who have been vaccine-injured and bereaved. Can you send a signal today, uh, Deputy First Minister, that you acknowledge those people and the pain and suffering that they go through on a daily basis? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look, absolutely. There's no doubt that there have been those that have been impacted, those that have been injured. Those are the people who are still enduring um, a huge amount of pain, a significant impact in relation to uh, their lives as well. So I am pleased to say that the First Minister and myself have both jointly agreed um, to meet. Um, with uh, the vaccine injured. Um, we are, are striving, and I can say this genuinely, we are striving to do that as soon as we possibly can. Um, and we are working to try to ensure that that can be put into the diary as soon as possible. We know that there is a keenness uh, to make them. I think, as I said earlier on these questions, there is nothing that uh, beats actually speaking to people directly about their direct experiences, and that's why we have been keen to do so. That's what we do for much um, of our week as well. So, look, absolutely, we will do that. Um, Mr. Fleury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that acknowledgement. It means a lot, and it will mean a lot to the people who have been injured and bereaved. Uh, Fibs NI, the support group who supports and helps people who have been vaccine injured, are planning a protest uh, on the steps of Stormont on Tuesday, the 2nd of July. 
maybe that would be a good date, Minister, uh, for you and the First Minister for all to meet those people. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, as I said, we'll continue to strive to get um, a diary data. We can have a date in the diary earlier rather than later. I'm happy to do that. I know that, as I said, there's a keenness uh, to get that meeting as soon as possible. But of course, if we can't before uh, that date, then certainly we will try to do so on that day. Pat Sheehan. The First Minister give an update on uh, programme for government preparations uh, and commit that it will be debated in this chamber and published for public consultation before the summer recess. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, as indicated, um, because of the election being called, it does have an impact um, in relation to the guidance as to when we can publish and to commence our consultation. Um, it is something that I had um, took the, the opportunity to, to mention um, last week to the First Minister of Scotland and Wales, and I know that they are also in a similar position in relation to their programme for government, where they have got to a point where it was reasonably well developed, but um, they will have to pause the uh, publication of that until after the election period. It does give us an opportunity, uh, of course, as work will continue over the course of the number of weeks to continue to look at those issues. It's important to say that look, whatever is published for the programme for government is not the final version. It is being published for consultation and for views, um, but we're also acutely aware that we want to hear from people as to those issues. So we want to get out to consultation as soon as possible. Absolutely, that should be commenced with a debate in this uh, assembly, uh, if at all uh, possible. And I believe it, it is and will be possible. Um, but of course, the key thing will be, be getting out there on the ground and, and throughout every part and place in uh, Northern Ireland to try to ensure that the maximum number of people respond to that consultation, and we're informed in, on the way forward. That brings to conclusion um, questions to the Deputy First Minister. Congratulations, Deputy First Minister. You're the First Minister to have got through all of your questions, both uh, uh, topical and the, the main set of questions. Uh, so we now move on to the Minister of Health. It's your first day, so your standard, standard has been set. And uh, I call Paula Bradshaw.